We are going to, this is on a Chabad website, Sefer Ha Mitzvot. The book of the 613 Mitzvot. This contains all of the commandments that are given directly by God in the Torah. According to the listing that the Rambam, Maimonides, came up with. So last week we read about the Shema. We're not going to read the whole thing, just the, well, it's pretty short. Let's see. Let's just read. Who would like to read this paragraph? Although prayer itself is ordained by the Torah, ex explained above, the set time for prayer or not, the sages establish the time for prayer. This is also the meaning of the statement. The prayers were established to correspond to the Talmud sacrifice. This means that the sage established the time of prayer to correspond to the times of sacrifices. Women are not obligated in the mitzvah. Okay, which mitzvah is it talking about when it says women are not obligated in the mitzvah? Uh, it's a trick, trick, trick question because this is after this whole section, but we didn't read the whole thing. So which mitzvah? Uh, uh, while reciting the Shema. Excellent. Mamashtov. All right. So when he says women are not obligated in this mitzvah, he's not talking about prayer. He's talking about the Shema. Very good. Okay. And of course, we mentioned last last week that it is praiseworthy. It's a, a very good thing if women also say the Shema. But a principle, a general rule for men and women is that while it is good that we voluntarily do mitzvot, even when we are not obligated to do them, but we should only do extra mitzvot that we're not obligated to do if we are already taking care of the obligations of the mitzvot that we are supposed to do, right? There's a difference. So, um, for example, if a woman wants to say Shema, this is great, but she should first make sure that she's taken care of her other obligations. So if she needed to go to the mikveh, if she counted her her days of counting the monthly cycle and she has not gone to the mikveh yet, she should make sure she went to the mikveh before she starts doing voluntary things afterwards. Right? It's just an example. Who can tell us what tamid means? Tamid. It says corresponds to the tamid sacrifices. Tamid means continual or always in Hebrew. Tamid. If you have a pen and a paper, it would be very good to write it down. So the sacrifices that are made in the temple in Israel, in the Beit HaMikdash, those sacrifices, the ones that are made every single day, they are called tamid sacrifices. They're called tamid because they're continual. They're made every day. So our daily prayers are established by our sages, not commanded by God directly. But our sages established the time of daily prayer based on the times of the sacrifices in the temple. And those times God did command in the Torah. All right, let's go to the 11th Miswa. Any volunteer for the... 11th Miswa. Shall I read? Yes, please. The, the 11th Miswa is that we are commanded to study and to teach the wisdom of Torah. This is called Talmud Torah. The source of these commandments is God's statement. Teach them to your children. Okay. So we see that the Miswa, the commandment of Talmud Torah, it does not only refer to studying, and it does not only refer to teaching. It refers to both. 
both of these. That's important to remember for what we read later on, because this also is going to um, touch on some controversial topics. <laughs> All right, any volunteer for the next next paragraph? The phrase is the phrase "teach them to your children" refers to your student. One similarly finds all over the students are called children, as it is written, and the children, example, the student of the prophets went out. Barabat, he's cool and mitzvot. He's cool as All right, next paragraph. Our sages also said there, the word teach them signifies that they should be sharp in your mouth. That when someone asks you something, you should not stammer, but rather answer him immediately. Excellent, excellent. All right, do we have anyone else for the next paragraph? Shall I read? Bavakasha, go right ahead, Bavakasha. This commandment is repeated numerous times. Learn them, do, do them, so that you will learn them. The commandment is stressed and encouraged in various passages spread throughout the Talmud. Excellent. And the last paragraph, anyone else want to read the last paragraph? Shall I? B'chavot. Go right ahead. B'chavot. Wom women are exempt from the commandment since the verse says, teach, teach your sons. Our sages explain the obligation applies to teaching your sons and not to your daughters as explained in Transcreated Kedushin. All right. Tractate Kedushin. Tractate. Um, okay. So does anybody have any questions? I'm expecting some questions. <laughs> so it means there is no value for daughters. No. <laughs> if, if we were misogynistic, then we could easily come to that conclusion. If we ignore, if we ignore everything else that's written in the Torah. And it's always a mistake when we take a verse from the Torah and try to understand it while ignoring everything else. So anytime we read something in the Torah, anything, especially if it's something that looks controversial or bad, we need to ask ourselves, how can I understand this passage in a way that is in harmony, that is consistent, that's consistent and harmony with the rest of the Torah. So anybody have any suggestions? Uh, if daughter learns, after that she become a mother. Mother can teach uh, her children. So even Correct. boy are Girl. So Correct. it is necessary to learn a girl also. I'm with you. So how do we explain this? By the way, what you said, it's not even really debated in the religious Jewish world. Nobody, nobody says you shouldn't teach your daughters. So what is the explanation of this? How do we make sense of it? If daughter couldn't know these laws, she can how can she teach their children? Exactly. Of course. Of course. But how do we make, how do we explain this? You're right. No, I don't think anyone will disagree with you. So yeah. how, what is a way that we can harmonize this teaching with what you said? What you said is common sense. Can I say oh, something? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, when a, husband is teaching his son father is teaching his son and okay. meanwhile the daughter is sitting there she is she also learning that same thing what her father is teaching to her brother and she can make her mind how to uh, do the miswa and she can do it self also by okay, the help of the yeah continue continue i'm sorry <laughs> it's enough okay no that, you're absolutely right uh, I'm not I don't I don't know if 
uh, that will satisfy most people who read this, but that's absolutely true. If if a woman, whether it's a daughter or a wife, if a woman is, if a female is around men who are serious about learning Torah, then for sure the husband and the wife, I'm sorry, then for sure the wife and the daughter are also going to learn things because they will hear the father teaching the son. But again, I don't think that will make most people um, appreciate what is written here. I'm trying to see how can we understand this in a way that makes sense, in a way that people would appreciate. Because at face value, the, like if we read it sim simply, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> okay, so I'll give a suggestion. Uh, we, we got an, an, a new person. Heather Hicks, welcome, welcome. All right, so I'm going to give you guys right, a suggestion. So give... When we looked at the beginning of this mitzvah, it's a mitzvah of learning Torah and teaching Torah. So this mitzvah, it's not only talking about learning, it's also talking about teaching. It's talking about both. So when we say Talmud Torah, we're talking about both concepts. All right, that's number one. Number two, and this is very important to remember, when we're learning Sefer HaMitzvot, Sefer HaMitzvot, it's the list of the 613 commandments, we need to remember that each of these commandments in Sefer HaMitzvot, the Rambam is only giving us a summary. He expects that we will learn the whole thing. But each, each mitzvah here is only a summary. It's not giving us all the details. So he's assuming that you will fill in the gaps by continuing to learn. So I can tell you, as someone who has already read the entire Sefer HaMitzvot <laughs> and have read all of the Mishneh Torah, I can tell you that the Rambam, when he writes this, he's definitely not saying that women should not learn. And he's not saying women should not teach. So the concepts of teaching and learning, those concepts uh, in general, it's not the same as this specific mitzvah. This specific mitzvah is talking about the combination of both and the combination of both teaching and studying the entire Torah, the entire Torah. Whereas women and daughters are not obligated, they're not obligated to teach and learn the entire Torah. They are absolutely obligated to learn and teach the parts of Torah that apply to them. So the difference is that a, a male, a male Israelite is obligated. It's not just praiseworthy. It's not just a good thing. It's an obligation for every male of Israel to learn and to teach the entire Torah. Everything. That means even things that do not apply to them. So... For example, I converted. I was not born Jewish, and I was certainly not born a Kohen. I was not born a Levite. I was not born a son of Aaron. So I cannot serve in the temple. I will never be able to do those mitzvot in the temple in Jerusalem. They don't apply to me. If I were a female, I would not be obligated to learn those laws. Okay? Because they don't apply to me. If I were a female, even though I'm not obligated to learn those laws, I'm allowed to. And it's it's praiseworthy if I do learn those laws. But uh, that's different from saying I'm obligated to. That's a different concept. To say something is good or, or in, encourage something that should be encouraged, that's different from saying it's an obligation. That's different from saying you must do something. So if I were a female, I do not have to learn the laws that do not apply to me as a female. If I want to, that's a different question. If I am a male, 
then I am obligated. I have to learn the laws of the priests serving in the temple, even if I will never do that myself, even if I am not a Kohen, even if I'm not a Levite, I still have to learn those laws. If I am a male, if I'm a, a man of Israel, I have the obligation to learn the laws of Nida, the laws regarding a woman's monthly cycle, menstrual cycle. I'm obligated to learn those laws, even though that law does not apply to me. <laughs> In contrast to that, a woman is not obligated to learn the laws of uh, seminal emissions, things that happen to males. Something can happen to a guy downstairs, you know. <laughs> so there are laws about that in the Torah. A woman's not obligated to learn that. If she wants to, she's allowed to. So when it says here, women are exempt from this commandment of learning and teaching Torah, it's talking about women being exempt. They are not obligated to keep the commandment to learn all of the Torah and teach all of the Torah. That only applies to males. But this is not saying that a woman is not allowed to learn these things. Now, as far as how our sages, when it says our sages explain, okay, it's talking about the obligation, specifically the obligation. And it's, again, it's talking about the obligation to learn the entirety of it. But absolutely, there's not, there's zero debate in the religious Jewish world, zero debate that a father is obligated to make sure that his daughters learn what parts of Torah apply to them. So that's the difference. That's the difference. Um, you guys have any comments or questions before we move on? No. Did it make, does it make more sense? Yes, Rabbi. <laughs> I, I, I suspect some of you are not satisfied, but that's okay. <laughs> no, we are satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Same thing with tefillin. Tefillin, it's not an obligation on women. But that doesn't mean that a woman cannot learn about it. However, she's not obligated to. There's a distinction. And in the Torah, it's important to know these distinctions. All right. Uh, this is a short one. So we will leave that for next week. Let's go to Hilchot Barachot. Oh. Mishneh Torah. Okay. Can someone tell me how to find the laws of blessings? This is the table of contents, the index for all of the Mishneh Torah. Where do we find the laws of blessings? Right, we're going to find it in the second book of Mishneh Torah called the Book of Love, Sefer Ahava. Everybody say Sefer Ahava. Sefer Ahava. Excellent. All right, and we're going to go to the subsection of Sefer Ahava. We're going to Berachot. Everybody say Berachot. 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 All right, Berachot are blessings. They are typically they are shorter words of praise and thanks to God. So we are in Perek Aleph. We are in Perek 1, chapter 1. We stopped, I believe, on the sixth halacha. Any volunteer to read the sixth halacha? Oh, you know, you know what? Before we continue, if you don't mind, I apologize for this. Before we continue, can someone summarize what we said about the the mitzvah of teaching Torah? If someone can summarize what you learned. Maybe first say it in English and then uh, translate it to Telugu or any other language. Can someone summarize what we learned here about studying and teaching Torah? Okay, I will choose somebody. 
Sipora. Yes. Could you summarize for us what what you understood from this mitzvah, the eleventh mitzvah of studying and teaching Torah? Uh, summarize in your own words, in in English, first in English. Uh, Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we can always we can always edit the video. Uh, no obligation for the women. What 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 is a woman not obligated to do? Uh, to do the shama, some mitzvahs. Okay, so like learning, and, learning and teaching Torah, a woman is not obligated to. Does that mean she's not obligated to learn? her own obligations from the Torah? Or does it mean she's not obligated to learn everything? By one, she can learn. And uh, um, by the Talmud, uh, she can't teach. Okay. But with regard to the mitzvot, does, uh, does this mean she cannot learn at all? Or only that she doesn't have to learn everything? She can have to learn everything. Okay, she doesn't have to. She's not required <laughs> to learn everything, right? Uh, by one. Correct. But if she wants to, she can. It's a mitzvah. She she has reward. If she wants to learn more than what she's obligated in, if a woman wants to learn more than her obligations, it's praiseworthy. It's a good thing. But we need to make a difference between praiseworthy and obligated. Those are two different things. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, is a woman obligated to learn what she's obligated to do from the Torah? The Shema? Not only the Shema. In, in general. In general. Is, is a female... Is a female obligated, is a female required to learn what she's required to do from the Torah? Yeah, yeah that's a, the question is, uh, yes or no question. Um, is a female, is a woman obligated to learn from the Torah what her requirements are? Somebody. Yeah. Yes, she can. Uh, is obligated because she, uh, she have to know the misworth what she have to apply for her own. Correct. Correct. So when this mitzvah says a woman is not obligated to learn Torah or teach it, it's talking about all of Torah. A woman is not obligated to learn everything in Torah, but. Yeah. But this mitzvah is not saying she is not obligated to learn her own obligations. She is. She is obligated to learn her own obligations. But she's not obligated to learn the obligations of the priests serving in the temple, for example. Putting teflin. Correct. Correct. For example. She can learn about tefillin, but she's not obligated to learn about tefillin. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But and most, go ahead. And the, <clears throat> what the king have to apply the uh, misra, she is not obligated to learn about them also. Exactly. A woman is not obligated to learn about the laws of kings and wars. There's a lot of laws in Jewish law about wars, how to fight a war. A woman is not required to know those laws. Um, if she wants to, she can. But she should first make sure she knows her own obligations first. But the number one thing we should not forget here is that even though it says a woman's not obligated to learn Torah and teach it, that's only talking about obligation to teach all of the Torah. It does not mean that a woman should not learn her own obligations, right? So those are two different concepts. A woman should learn her own obligations. Okay, can someone translate uh, 
summarize this and translate it to Telugu or Tamil or Hindi? Just in your own no words. No Telugu people. No Telugu people. Are you serious? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. Some are there. My sisters, uh, they are uh, near for me. Okay. They are in my house. Ah, uh, so you don't you don't want to translate it to? Um, okay, no problem. To Telugu. Mm. No problem. Does anyone want to translate it to any other language? Just in your own words, you can summarize. Yes, Rabbi. जैसे कि बताया गया है कि या कि गैर वाव मिसवाद जो है कमांडमेंट का कि तलमुद में उनको बताया गया कि स्टडी और टीच ये दोनों ही जो मेन चीज है कि हमें सीखना भी है और उसे समझना भी है और ये भी खासकर ये भी बताया गया कि वो जो तोरात के मुताबिक जो लॉज है जो हमें आदमियों के लिए खासकर उनके लिए जो ज्यादा जरूरी है उन चीजों को मानना वो औरतों के लिए इतना मायने नहीं है पर औरतों के लिए वो मिस वो जो वो मान सकते हैं जैसे कि उनके निदा के बारे में जो लॉज है उसमें वो चीजों को वो औरतें अप्लाई कर सकती हैं पर अगर वो चाहते हैं कि अब कुछ और नॉलेज लेने के लिए तो रात के मुताबिक तो वो ले सकते हैं वो प्रेस वर्दी हो, हो सकता है उनके लिए कि वो उन चीजों को जान उन चीजों के बारे में जानकारी रखती है पर खास तौर से ये जो अः हुक्म है वो खास तौर से आदमियों के लिए है कि वो अपने बच्चों को अपने बेटों को जहन नशी कराए वो अपने बच्चों बेटों के दिमाग दिल और उनको हाशिम के बारे में उन लॉज के बारे में वो बताए अपने बच्चों बेटों को And let's go to the laws of blessings. Everybody say berachot, berachot. Berachot. Okay, that is a blessing. Um, Sipora, would you like to read the first halacha, halacha six of chapter one? Okay. All the blessings may be recited in any language, provided one recites a translation of the. Text um, ordained by the sages. A person who changes the text fulfills his obligation. None. What is that? Nonetheless. Nonetheless. It means anyway or even though. Even though he changed the text. Nonetheless. Since the mentions God's name. His sovereignty. Man. Sovereignty. Sovereign. What is that? Okay, so sovereignty, the G is going to be silent. They don't pronounce it. Sovereignty. It's from a Latin word. Uh, so, sovere. Sovere has to do with like being above everything. And ren has to do with being like a king. Or having lordship, being master. So sovereignty means the fact that God is the king over everything. Sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And the subject of the blessing, although he did so in an ordinary language. Okay, so we can say these blessings that our sages, Hazal, instituted established we can say these blessings in any language even though we should try to translate it as accurately as we can but you do not have to worry about making a little mistake in the translation as long as you mention that god is hashem the eternal the highest existence the most absolute existence as long as you mention that you mention that he is king over everything king of the universe king of all existence and you mention the subject of the blessing then you fulfill the obligation even if the translation is not perfect okay can 
someone translate this to any local language? This is a very good halakha to remember. You, you do not need to wait until you learn all the blessings in Hebrew to say them. It's wonderful to say these blessings that we're going to learn here, even if you don't know it in Hebrew yet, even if you're only using a translation. It's still a very good thing to do. I, we should, not just good, it's in halakha, it's an obligation to say these blessings that we are learning here. Can someone summarize this in any language of India? Bharat. Yes, Rabbi. It's Kula Mitzvot. It's Kula Mitzvot. जैसे कि यहां बताया गया कि जब हम बरकत पढ़ते हैं तो बरकत अगर किसी भी लैंग्वेज में ट्रांसलेशन ट्रांसलेट किया हुआ दूसरा भाषा हिब्रू से दूसरे भाषा में तो अगर उसमें अधाशेम के लिए कुछ अलग सा वर्ड आता है तो हम उनको इस्तेमाल इस तरीके से भी कर सकते हैं किंग ऑफ यूनिवर्स राजा जो पूरे कायनात के राजा और <coughs> उनके नाम की महिमा के लिए हम इस तरह से इस्तेमाल कर सकते हैं ओके तो नाजरीन जैसे कि अभी सिस्टर ने जैसे बताया आपको कि आप किसी भी लैंग्वेज में दुआ पढ़ सकते हैं बरकत की तो इसमें आप जैसे सिस्टर ने बताया कि दुनिया के राजा या यूनिवर्स के राजा या कोई भी आप टाइटल दे सकते हैं इसके साथ साथ मैं ये आपको पर्सनली बताना चाह रहा हूँ हम अपनी लोकल लैंग्वेज में जैसे उर्दू और हिंदी बोलते हैं नॉर्थ इंडिया में तो हम खुदा लफ्ज यूज करते हैं और अल्लाह लफ्ज यूज कर सकते हैं ठीक है तो इसमें कोई दोहराई नहीं है इसमें आपको हिचकिचाने की जरूरत नहीं है आप यूज कर सकते हैं अगर आपका यकीन है कि आप अल्लाह और खुदा उसी खुदा को बोल रहे हैं जो इब्राहिम सलाम के खुदा थे थैंक यू शुक्रान नकमील अरबी इंता Little bit. <laughs> Little bit. Solo Urdu. Only Urdu. Urdu faqat. Yeah. Urdu bas. Do you have the word bas, bas in Urdu for like only? Bas. Bas. Yeah, B-A-S. I, I, I'm not familiar, but I I heard that word. Yeah. I think I heard someone say that when well, I was in, in India. My grandfather died, so we are lacking of some uh, Arabic. Ah. Because... He has a Bible on Arabic only. Oh, wow. That's, that's cool. All right. Bon Amshikh. Let's continue. Halakha number seven. Shall I read? Bechavod. Everybody say, Bechavod. 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 What does Bechavod mean? Bechavod. What does that mean? So, Bechavod, it's a polite way of saying, go ahead, we're continue. That's right. And it literally, it means with honor. With honor. Bechavod. Be means with. Chavod is honor. All right. Bechavod. A person, a person should recite all the blessings loud enough for him to hear what he is saying. Nevertheless, a person who does not recite a blessing out loud fulfill his obligation whether he is verbalized a blessing or merely recite it is it in his heart okay so the halakha is la in the proper way that we do it the way we're supposed to do it we should say all these blessings loud enough that we can hear it in our own ears all right so we should not mumble the blessings so quietly that we cannot even hear it. We we should be able to hear it. 
And that way, people who are near us, they can also say Amen if they want to. However, if you, for some reason, you said it so quietly, you cannot hear it. Even if you don't say it at all, you only say it in your heart. According to the Mishneh Torah, the Rambam, you still fulfill your obligation. You still, you still did the obligation. Even though that would be the Avad, that's after the fact. Can someone give me an example of a situation where maybe it makes sense, it's logical to say the blessing silently in your heart, even though in an ideal situation we would say it out loud? What's an example? Can you repeat once more? Yes. Um, we are not supposed to say these blessings silently. We're supposed to say the blessings loud enough that we can hear it with our own ear. But if we say it silently, if we say any of the blessings in Judaism silently, we still fulfill our obligation. You still did the obligation. Even if you said it silently. But the correct way to do it is to say it loud enough that you can hear it. Now, now I'm asking, is there a situation in life where maybe it makes sense? It's logical to say it silently. What's a situation that it, it would probably be a good thing to say it silently? So, and you're following a Jewish tradition to eat in a Chinese restaurant on Christian on Christmas yeah. Day. Don't want people to know that you're Jewish, so you don't say the. Oh my outlaw. goodness! <laughs> <laughs> that that is definitely an example. Yeah, <laughs> could definitely be an example. I think that got started because it used to be the only restaurant in America open on Christmas Day. Yes, but now that's right. That's right. Um, and. Probably any situation where it would make sense to say the blessing silently, those situations are not ideal situations. They're not the best situations. Can someone give another example of maybe a situation where it is logical to say the blessing silently, even though normally we should say it loud enough to hear it? What's another situation? Circumstance. Scenario. <laughs> Any other suggestions? Maybe. When? I, I could not hear. Hospital. Hospital? Yeah. Yeah, I would say just about any situation where if you say it uh, out loud, if it might be dangerous or if it could danger make danger for someone else or if it could just make your life extra difficult like maybe um if you're in an area where there are crazy people or Ooh, sick people like, nearby you don't want them yeah, to like think our, that uh, go ahead like our current condition, right yeah you don't want them to think that you have a uh that you're on drugs or have a mental problem. I, I actually had this happen to me before in the United States because I was very, very strict with this for a long time. So e even like at a normal doctor's office, <laughs> I would say the blessing loud enough that I could hear it. And, and I feel weird to be looking at someone while I do it. So I would look at a wall. I would just stand in front of a wall to say it after I use the bathroom, for example. So one time I was saying the blessing after I used the bathroom and in the middle of the blessing, I could hear one of the doctors say to someone else, what is he doing at the wall? They're like, he's, he's saying something at, to the wall. <laughs> it was very, very awkward. And then, you know, like they don't know anything about Judaism. If you're in a place where a lot of people hate Jews, you don't need to expose yourself unnecessarily. It, it might not be smart. And 
in situations where it's truly dangerous, if you live very near a yeah, very so large threatening. Yeah, if, if you live near a Muslim, a large Muslim population. Yes, now in present uh, present yeah. situations, we we can't read, we can't uh, say loudly uh, blessings in front of Muslims. Yeah, but I can do that, Rabbi, on in front of uh, Muslim cousins because I speak a uh, kind of little bit Arabic and a little bit Urdu, so <laughs> they don't even care. <laughs> but, but you do not I'm want them to know. I, I would say if you do not have good security, if you are not mm -hmm. able to have self-defense, it's it's never a good idea yeah, to let, I agree. let the whole Muslim world know that you're the only Jewish house on your streets, you know? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. We, I agree, God, I agree. God wants us to be reasonable, to use common sense. Okay, let's do next talakha. Would you like to read the next paragraph, the next talakha? Oh, Shalom. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Let's uh, translate this to our local languages. Can I can I translate, Rabbi? Bachavo, tis kula mitzvot. Shalom, brother. Okay, shalom. हमें जब हम लोग बरकत पढ़ते हैं, तो बरकत जो है वो हमेशा हमें लाउडली पढ़नी चाहिए हमें उसको जो है वो जोर से जो है वो पढ़ना चाहिए ताकि कम्युनिटी के अंदर जो लोग हैं वो उसको ध्यान से सुन सकें और एक एक शब्द पर जो है कि जो उसका वर्ड है उसके ऊपर वो मनन कर सकें तो इसलिए हमेशा ये जो है प्रमोट किया जाता है इस बात को कि ब्लेसिंग्स जो हैं उनको हमें लाउडली पढ़ना चाहिए लेकिन अगर कुछ ऐसी सिचुएशंस होती हैं जहां पर हम हमारी जान को खतरा है या हमारी कम्युनिटी को खतरा है सो so, जिस तरह से पहले बात हो रही थी कि जैसे मुस्लिम कम्युनिटीज होती हैं जहां पे उनकी ज्यादा आबादी है या वहां उनकी ज्यादा जो है पॉपुलेशन है तो ऐसे पॉपुलेटेड एरिया में वहां पर आप को ये बताने की जरूरत नहीं है कि वी आर ज्यूज और हम यहूदी हैं तो वहां पर आपको ये बात जो है वो शो करने की जरूरत नहीं इसलिए आपको वहां पे जोर से जो है वो ब्लेसिंग्स पढ़ने की जरूरत नहीं है और ना ही कुछ ऐसी मुकाम पे ऐसी जगह पे जहां पर आपको जो है आ, कुछ मुसीबतों का सामना करना पड़ सके या फिर कुछ मुसीबतों का सामना आ, आ, वो ब्लेसिंग्स पढ़ने से जो है वो हो सकता है तो वहां पर हमें जो है आ, इस बात का पूरा ध्यान रखना चाहिए कि ये जो ब्लैसिंग्स हैं ये जो बरकते हैं बराखोत हैं उनको हमें अपने हार्ट में पढ़ना चाहिए अपने दिल में पढ़ना चाहिए ताकि जो हमारी ब्लेसिंग्स हैं उनकी भी रिस्पेक्ट बनी रहे और हमारी जो जीवन है हमारी जो जिंदगी है उस पर भी कोई आंच ना आए शुक्रिया थैंक यू आफन यस सर It's make me feel coward, personally. I have to stand for my uh, root and the heritage of Israel and the, the people of Israel and all the, my belief. Personally, I, I believe that. This is a wonderful thing to do as long as you know that you're not in true danger. But if, we, if there is a reasonable suspicion that you may endanger yourself or your family. There are only three mitzvot, only three of the commandments of Torah that we should be willing to die for. And saying these blessings loud enough that you can hear it in your ear, it's not, not one of them. But I'm talking about in situations where there is a real concern. If you don't have a real concern, then... Absolutely. We should say it loud enough that we can hear it. Also, I would say that if you live in a large Jewish community, you're not the only house on the street. There's many streets of Jewish people. God willing, God willing, in our lifetime, there will be whole neighborhoods of Jewish, Jewish families in India. Whole neighborhoods, not just one or two houses here and there. If you live in a place where there are Muslims, but 
you have your own Jewish neighborhood, so you're not all by yourself, then it's not as much of a concern because it's like a fish in the ocean. The fish is more in danger when it's all by itself. But when there's a lot of fish together, the chance for you to get hurt is much lower. It's basic statistics. Um, so in an ideal situation, yeah, say it as loud as you want, especially if you live in a large Jewish community. And that's what we should work toward to make that happen. Um, also, if you're in a large community, if God forbid, Hashem Yishmor, if there's an attack, then you have a whole community to come to your defense. But if you are all by yourself, then you're all by yourself. And God does not want us to test him. We can only test God with, with uh, honoring our parents and living a healthy life and, and with sadaqah. But when it comes to dangerous things, we're not supposed to expect or demand a miracle. Um, God can do miracles, but we are not supposed to say, for example, that I have heart disease, so I don't go to the doctor because God will save me. God never promised us that he will save us miraculously in every single difficult situation. It, it's just not, not reality. God, we should rely on a miracle when we have no other choice. But generally speaking, we need to be, we need to be, we need to be smart. <laughs> so we just be followed only the pre law. Say it again. I cannot hear you. In please. that situation, right? I, I couldn't hear you. Say it again, please. So we have to follow only three laws. But in that condition, yes. Yes, if you are in a life-threatening situation, there are only three laws that we should risk being killed instead of breaking those laws. Does anyone know what those three laws are? Yeah, of course I do. Go ahead, please share it with us. Denying God, and murder someone, and raping someone. Okay, so I'm going to say it a little more loudly. So the three mitzvot that we should never break, even if it risks death, even if it means we might be in danger of death, that is, we should not worship anything other than the one true creator. So we should not worship anything that is created. No idol, no human. We should not murder someone. That means we should not kill someone in an unjust manner. And we should not have intercourse with someone that God forbade us from having intercourse with, whether that's rape or adultery, anything like that. So if someone puts a gun to our head and says, you must, God forbid, you must rape this person or I will kill you, we should be willing to die instead of raping someone. But any other commandment of the Torah the halakha is that we are supposed to break any other halakha, any other mitzvah. God wants us to break it, according to Jewish tradition. God wants us to break that mitzvah temporarily in order to save our life. And of course, there are different details and nuances to this, but this is the general rule. And if a person is ever in that situation, God forbid, if we are in that situation and your fear is so great that you you break the commandments, even if you worshipped an idol, but you were forced to do it, you are not punished. There is no punishment in Jewish law if you do these things because you were forced to do it. We're not supposed to do it, but if you did it anyway... There is no penalty. You don't get a death penalty. You don't get caught at. Anybody have any questions about this? Shukran, Rabbi. Jazakallahu khairan. Jazakallahu. I, I, wow, my Arabic is getting bad. Jazakallahu khair. Jazakallahu khair. Shukran, Rabbi. Afwa. 
All right. Um, if anyone wants to translate again to your native language, I think we did Hindi or Urdu. Does anybody want to summarize what we've just discussed about the blessings or the mitzvot, the three mitzvot? Okay, we'll continue. Um, Brother Yosef, Ataitano, you with us? Shalom, Rabbi. Yes, yes, I'm be with you. Okay, it's the honor is mine. Would you mind also translating this part? Because this is pretty important. I think we had someone translated maybe to Tamil or Telugu, but it would be useful to have it also in Hindi. Let let me let me read, uh, Rabbi. Rabbi, are you talking about the three laws, three major laws, right? Uh, that's what we were talking about, but I'm asking my brother Yosef if he would translate this halacha six. Yeah, okay. If you want to translate about the three laws, please feel free to do so, but we will do it after after Yosef translates. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll do that. So, uh, not, not the, uh, shall, shall I? Go ahead. It'll give Yosef time to think about what he will say. Yeah, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it quick. So, uh, Nazreen, Hamare, Mazab Me, Ham, Parteniki, तीन हमारे ऐसे कानून हैं जिनका हमें आ, हर हालत में उस, उसको पूरा करना है उसको मानना है चा, चाहे क्यों ना हमारी जान पे बनाए तो जब ये आ, हालात हो कि हमारे जान पे बनाए और हम उस कानून को फिर भी पूरा करें वो तीन ऐसे कानून हैं कि एक तो हमें इब्राहिम आले सलाम हमारे उनके जो खुदा है वही हमारे खुदा है और उनके अलावा भी हमारा खुदा नहीं है और हम दुनिया में किसी भी तरह के मजहब को और उन, उनके जो भी अकीदे हैं उनको नहीं मानते और ना ही उनकी इबादत करेंगे दूसरा हम किसी भी इंसान का खून नहीं कर सकते तीसरा हम किसी भी गुनाह में नहीं पड़ सकते जैसे कि जिस्मानी तौर पे जैसे कि आपने गलत कार्य और इसके अलावा और किसी भी मतलब किसी इस आदमी आदमी और औरत और आप दोनों में इन्वॉल्व कर सकते हैं थैंक यू रबा थैंक यू योसेफ अता इतान आर आर यू रेडी अता मुखान अता मुखान स्कैन कैन कैन याला बखाबो अह हम लोग जो हमारी बरकतें हैं उनको किसी भी जुबान में पढ़ सकते हैं लेकिन हमें इस बात का ध्यान रखना चाहिए कि जो हमारे सेजस ने जो हमारे बुजुर्ग हैं जो कौम के बुजुर्ग हैं उन्होंने जो टेक्स्ट जो हैं वो लिखे हुए हैं या उनको जो उन्होंने जो है वो हमें दिए हुए हैं तो हमें इस बात का ख्याल रखना चाहिए कि उसमें कुछ बातों की ऑब्लिगेशन जो है वो उनको हमें मानना है मसलन जैसे खुदा का नाम जो है हाशिम का जो नाम है उसकी इज्जत के लिए और उसकी जो है बढ़ाई के लिए जो है हमें जो है वो किसी भी ऐसे शब्द का इस्तेमाल नहीं करना चाहिए जो खुदा की इज्जत यानी हाशिम की इज्जत में जो है वो फर्क डाले तो दूसरा जो है कि जो ब्लैसिंग का जो सब्जेक्ट है ब्लैसिंग का जो जिसको हम कहेंगे कि मजमून है वो मजमून जो है उसमें किसी तरह का फेर बदल ना हो और हालांकि हम उसको किसी भी दूसरी जबान में भी उसको पढ़ सकते हैं लेकिन वो अल्फाज जो हैं वो बदलने नहीं चाहिए और खुदा की जो तारीफ वाले जो अल्फाज हैं उनमें किसी भी तरह का कोई गड़बड़ ना हो इन बातों का ख्याल रखते हुए हम जो है बरकतों को किसी भी जबान में पढ़ सकते हैं शुक्रिया Okay. Um, do we have any volunteers to read Halakha 8? Halakha Het. Let's get a lady. Any lady you want to read 
הלכה אחת ואיף הלכה. Whenever one recites a blessing, one should not make any interruption between the blessing and the subject for which the blessing is recited. If one makes an interruption with other matters, one must recite the blessing again. All right. Who would like to continue? Toda Rabba. Thank you very much. Tizkula yes. Mitzvah. Tizkula so. If, however, one makes an interruption which relates to the subject of the blessing, one does not have to repent, repeat the blessing. What is implied? When a, when a person recites a blessing over bread and before eating says, bring salt, bring food. Rabbi, please move it. Tell me where to move, up or down or like? Up, upward. Like this? No, no. This the way? Down portion. Yeah. Okay. Blessing over bread and before eating says, bring salt, bring food, give so and so to eat, bring food for the animal or the like he needs to not to repeat the blessing. Okay. So long story short, if you say any blessing, we should not make an interruption between saying the blessing and doing what the blessing is about. So if I gave a blessing, if I said the blessings of praise to God, I told God, thank you for creating the fruit of the vine, the blessing before we drink wine or grape juice. So once I say that blessing, I should drink the grape juice. I should not have a conversation with someone and then drink. I should not then go to the bathroom and then come out and drink. Once I say the blessing, I should do what the blessing is about. However, the second part of this halakha says that if you do something after the blessing, which is related to the topic, the purpose of the blessing, then you don't need to repeat the blessing because that's not considered an interrupt interruption. It's related to the purpose of the blessing. So, for example, if you said the blessing over wine or grape juice, bure periha gofen, blessed are you, O Lord, creator of the fruit of the vine, if I said that, but then I did not drink the wine, I asked, please pour wine for my wife. Please pour wine for my husband. That's okay, because it's related to the purpose of the blessing. But that's all you should say. You should not then have a whole conversation. Once they bring the wine, then everybody should drink, for example. Can someone give another example? Any other example? If you say the blessing over bread on Shabbat, Hamotzi lechem min haaretz, blessed are you, O Hashem, who brings forth bread from the earth. So we should not talk between saying Hamotzi lechem and eating the bread. Once you say the blessing, after that you should. Eat the bread immediately. But it's okay to make an interruption after that blessing if you need to tell someone, please pass me a piece of bread. Or, like it says here, could you bring me some salt? Or maybe some kind of curry uh, that you want to eat with the bread. That's all acceptable. Can someone summarize this for us? Yes, Rabbi. Okay. Please summarize in English and then in your native language. When we are reciting the blessing of, upon the uh, Gafin, we are saying, Baruch Atah Adonai Elohinu Malik HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu, Vimisata Viswanu. Uh, oh, sorry. It's okay. Bore Peri Ha Gafin. All right. We have to drink the wine. And if we are... Uh, talking to other and we are going to bathroom it is not compulsory to repeat it again oh hold on hold on so yeah yeah after we say the blessing for example 
we should immediately drink the wine. But yeah. if we made an interruption that is related to the purpose of the blessing, that blessing was for drinking wine, correct? Yeah. Right? Okay. So if we made an interruption that's related to the purpose of the blessing, then you do not need to repeat the blessing. For example, if you need someone to bring more wine, or if you want wine to be poured for your guest or your husband, then you do not need to repeat the blessing. But if you said the blessing and you made an interruption that is not, not connected to the blessing, for example, you started watching TV before you drank the wine, then that is not allowed. <laughs> or if you went to the bathroom, that's not, that's not related to the topic of the blessing. So if, if you do that kind of interruption, then you need to say the blessing again. Did, did that okay. cl clarify? Did that make more sense? Yes, Rabbi. Okay, let's do it again. Summarize again. <laughs> in Hindi? Uh, first in English. First in English. Uh, when we are reciting the blessing upon the Gafin, and we are uh, we are interrupting in in between. We can recite the bl blessing once more. Okay. Correct. Yes. If if the interruption is not necessary for drinking the wine or doing whatever the blessing is about, then we should say it again. Okay. But if uh, if the interruption was related to the purpose of the blessing, then you do not need to say it again. Can someone else uh, summarize? And I want to make sure that you guys understand this. Shalom. Basically, uh, what you do is really before you decide the blessing, Example, Baruch Atad Melech Olam, Shechol Nihi Abid Baro. We must honor Hashem and do what we prayed for first and then the others. Am I right? Correct. Bye -bye. Correct. Correct. But for so example... That's a matter of... Go ahead. Yes. Go that's ahead. a matter of honoring Hashem because yes. when you recite, uh, uh, recite a blessing, he's honoring Hashem. We are, our undivided attention should be upon that blessing and we should not consent considered upon anything else that's a dishonor that's true that's that's correct so for example the blessing that you gave this is a general blessing that you would say over like water or meat or cheese so for example if you said that blessing before you eat then after you said that blessing you should eat it immediately you don't need to eat everything you don't have to eat yeah. everything but you need to take at least one bite Okay. Now I have a question for you. If you okay. said the blessing before food or drink, and there's different blessings, but any one, it doesn't matter which one. If you said a blessing before uh, eating or drinking, and after you said the blessing, you wanted your wife to bring more or your child to bring more food. Are you allowed to say that? Can you tell them to bring say, more food? No, I can't say it. I can't. No, I can't say that because that's with disrespecting Hashem. So if I say the blessing, I must consume the water. Uh, after that, I can do that. Am okay. Right? So, so Example, ideally, ideally, that is correct in an ideal situation. But if you asked for your wife or your child to bring more water or more meat, if you did that, after you said the blessing, before eating the bite, it's not considered a forbidden interruption. The reason is because it's related to the purpose of the blessing. Okay. It's related. Uh, it, if, the, yeah. if the interruption is related to the purpose, the topic of the blessing, then it's not considered a forbidden interruption. But... Okay. But if you said the blessing and then you started talking about what you want to do uh, after Shabbat, that's not allowed. 
Like having a whole conversation is not allowed. Or saying the blessing and then going and watching TV before you eat the food. Yeah, that's okay. Can you summarize one more time? Yeah, I, I need to have a clarify something. Supposing I say uh, for blessing for water, I say shekhon hi abit baro. And if I'm eating a fruit, I say baro katat na melekolam bore haet. Right? Uh, have, generally, have I got to generally. take the water first and then the fruit, or the fruit first and the water? How does it go? Okay. So if you would say the blessing over the water, then you would take a drink of the water. You would take a sip of the water. Okay. You don't have to eat all of it or drink all of it. Just one sip. And then if you want to eat the fruit, you say the blessing on the fruit. And then you take a bite of the fruit. And you do not need to say the blessing again and again and again for every bite. You only say the okay. blessing one time before you eat it. And then that's good for the entire meal. Ken. Ken. Sababa. Sababa. <laughs> Sababa means cool, like all right, cool, I, or like I understand, so, or that's great. Sababa, great, Ken. Uh, right. Rabbi, uh, yes, sir. Supposing I'm ta I'm taking a glass of water, okay. And I recite the blessing for water, right? She called here Bidvaro. Then I have fruits on my table. Before I take the fruit, I will say Barukata Melekolam Boreha Eight, and there I have the salad, the vegetables. Okay. So I say another blessing for the salad. What, what kind of salad is it? What kind of? I uh, say say uh, salad means uh, cabbages and beetroot and carrot. Okay, uh, so Oslo. so the general rule is, and, and we're going to learn this in this book, so we can't cover everything right now, but basically, if it is a type of fruit that grows on a tree, you say bore peri ha etz. Etz means tree. Okay. So you're going to say yes. if it's a kind of fruit that grows on a tree, you're going to praise God for the fruit of the tree. If it is a kind of plant that grows more closely to the ground, like cabbage or lettuce or carrots or tomatoes, okay, those kinds of vegetables, then you do not say, thank you, God, or praise be you, God, who created the fruit of the tree. You don't say that. If it is a type of fruit or vegetable that doesn't grow on a tree. Then you would say, You would say, You are praised, you are worshipful, O eternal, our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the earth, or fruit of the dirt, fruit of the ground, okay. something like that. Okay. Sababa? Okay. Sababa. Sababa. <laughs> By the way, that's not a proper Hebrew word, but it's a common Hebrew slang. Oh, slang expression. Slang. No problem. All right. Now you have to summarize this and translate it. Okay. We're we're trying to what help every because this is all recorded. Okay. So when I get time, I will separate these to make different videos Thanks. so that people can have access to these uh to, to Jewish teaching in your native languages. Ken. So virtually, when you recite a blessing, uh, first uh, we honor Hashem and first do what we blessed for and take it, and then we can do the others. And if you, if you, once you said the blessings, and if you say something else, and if you're watching TV or if you uh, look at the phone, that means you have uh, violated His holiness and we recite the blessing again. Right? Correct. Correct. But what if? The interruption was related to the topic of the blessing. Then what happens? Then, since it's related to the blessing, uh, then of course I don't have to recite the blessing again. Correct. Correct. Okay. Technically, that's that's correct. Sababa. Sababa. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and translate it. Bevakasha. So basically, whenever we take a meal, first we recite the blessing, whether it's for water whether it's for fruit or whether it's for vegetables. Uh, normally what I do is, uh, when I have fruits and vegetables, I say, Baruch Atah, Adonai, Malek Olam, Shekho, Nihabit Varo. So one right. blessing. Uh, but can you, can, I, you, can you translate it to your local language? Uh, in in Sinhala? Whatever your local language is. Are you in Sri Lanka? I'm in Sri Lanka, so my local language is English. Oh, really? <laughs> 
Um, do do you know any other languages of of India? Uh, no, no. Uh, Sri Lankan oh. language is called Singhala. Singhala. Correct. It's a Singhala. Singhala. But uh, no one else will understand from here. Okay. You want, me to, you want me to translate? You can. You can if you want to. For uh, for if if you think there are people who would want to know. Api ahare ganne sella. ोनेशीर्वादी um let's see did someone else want to translate this concept does anyone else want to translate this concept Sonia, are you still with us? All right. Sipora, are you with us? Yes, I'm listening. Okay, did that make sense? I think we went over like five times. <laughs> did, did, did you have any questions? No. No? No. You're still not able to translate, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I miss your translations. When you translate, I'm starting to hear certain words. I don't know what they mean, but I'm. my brain is starting to recognize some words. Can you read the next halakha, please? Shall I read? Yes, please. Bakhavod. Bakhavod. A person who is ritually impure is permitted to recite all the blessings. This applies regardless of whether the impurity is of a type from which one can impurity one oneself on the same day or not. A person who is naked should not recite a blessing until he covers his gen. Uh, um, that means sexual organs. Gen genitals. To whom does this apply? A man, woman may, may recite blessings while naked, provided they uh, sit with the Gentiles facing the ground. Okay. And I don't want to emphasize this word too much, but but it's important that we learn <clears throat> that we learn this word because there are there are a few. English words that sound similar to this. <clears throat> okay, let me see how I can write this. Um, let's see, annotate text. Okay, so you have this word. Can you guys see what I'm typing? Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Now there's, so this sounds like je ni, let me, je ni, all. That's what it sounds like. Or singular is like this. Now we have another word in English, um, gentle which means, uh, how do I explain this? Um, caring touch or soft touch or um, yeah, basically to be careful. And this is Jin Tol. Then we have this word, Jin Tile. 
And that is, usually it means a non-Jew. Thai. Thai. Now I'm capitalizing the part of the word that you should hear the most, the accent part of the word. So the first word, which is sexual organs, is genital, genital. So the accent is on the end, genital. And then this word, gentle, the accent's on the first, gentle. And there's no knee sound, just gentle. And then gentile is a non-Jew, Gentile. And here, the accent's on ta, Gentile, Gentile. Actually, no, it's on the first one as well. Gen Gentile. 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 Okay. Uh, I hope you guys forgive me, but I think it's important to learn these things because it's always embarrassing when you're when you learn new words in a language and it sounds similar to other common words. So you don't want to say the wrong. <laughs> Trust me, I learned Hebrew. I had mistakes like this in Hebrew. It's hilarious, but it's very embarrassing. <laughs> so if you want, you can repeat after me. Um, genital is sexual. I'm sorry. Gen genital is is sexual organ genital 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 so the middle syllable is not accented genital genital that is sexual organs then gentle gentle is a soft or delicate touch and gentile is a non-jew all right i will spare you guys the embarrassment so I will just, this will stay in the video so you can practice if you want to improve, uh, if you want to avoid awkward situations speaking English. <laughs> All right. Oh, now I don't know how to remove this. So, okay. So this halakha, oh no, how do I get rid of this? There we go. So this halakha, it says, that anybody can say these blessings. When our sages taught us blessings that we should say, as long as your body is clean, we have not gotten to that part of the law yet, but as long as your body is clean, reasonably clean, you can say these blessings even if you are ritually not pure. So ritual impurity, it's not the same as having dirt on you. There are two different concepts. Some kinds of dirt will make you impure, but not all types of dirt. So, for example, just because you may have some dirt or mud on your arm, maybe you were working in the garden, you can still say the blessing as long as you're, uh, as long as it's not like excrement or feces, like poop, right? If you have poop, you, you need to clean that off. We're not allowed to say a blessing with that. But if it's just dirt, or if you're ritually impure, for example, if you have touched a dead body and you did not make a, you did not immerse after a certain amount of time, or if you are a woman on her monthly cycle, all of these examples, you can still say the blessings. So ritual impurity does not mean you cannot say the blessing. Anybody have any questions about that? No. No? Okay. Um, and then here it says a person uh, who is naked should not say a blessing until he covers his private parts, his genitals, sexual organs. So if you are naked, you should not say a blessing. But this is specifically in reference to men. But if it is a female, then obviously it's more proper 
to be clothed if you're saying a blessing, obviously. But this is talking about the strict letter of the law. So strictly speaking, a woman is allowed to say a blessing even if she is not clothed, as long as her sexual organs are not exposed, meaning they're facing downward, right? And this may seem weird in our modern lifestyle, especially like in the West. I honestly, I don't know all the customs in India, but in the United States, the average person does not sleep naked. Some people do, but most people don't. Most people sleep with at least shorts on. Um, if anyone wants to educate me, what, what would you say is the common practice in India? Do people sleep with shorts on or naked under a cover, under sheets? No, they never <laughs> naked. <laughs> okay. Now, I know these things are like taboo. So feel free to not comment if you just don't want to comment. Um, now, in in ancient times... And this is probably still true in certain places around the world. In ancient times, they did not have air conditioner. And especially in the Middle East, it could be as hot as the hottest parts of India all year long in parts of the Middle East. So people were also much more poor. We always have to remember when learning halakha. We're reading this in a modern situation. And also in India, it's much more modern than the world was historically. So the average person in ancient times were very, very poor. So you could have a family, husband and wife and three children, and they might only have one blanket. They also did not have air conditioner. If you lived in a small house with a tiny room, it could get very hot, especially in the summer. So if you read Talmudic literature, it becomes plain that it was a common practice. It becomes obvious that it was a common practice 2,000 years ago in the Middle East that people would sleep naked under a sheet. And because of that, you have laws like this one, not only this one, but there are other laws that, that refer to it where it assumes that many people were sleeping unclothed at night. So the reason for this halakha, it could be that a woman, uh, she had bread, she ate, and then she got ready to go to sleep. She's naked and she's under the sheet in bed. But then suddenly she remembers she did not say the blessing after she ate. Now, people lived in small, small houses. They often only had one room. and I think this is sometimes the case even in India still, but India is still a lot more modern than it used to be 2,000 years ago. So they did not have like different rooms typically. Everybody slept in the same room. If she gets up and she wants to put on clothes, it can make a lot of noise. It could wake people up. Um, she would need to find her clothes. Maybe she... She won't find the clothes, so she will need to turn on a candle to help find find her clothes. I don't know what the situation is. So then if she turns on the candle, it might wake people up. So basically, the halakha is being forgiving. It's being lenient so that it will not make their lifestyle more inconvenient. The halakha does not want to make life more difficult than necessary. So that's why it's going into this topic. Okay, and one last time to learn these words, the difference between these words. Sexual organs, genital. Caring, gentle. And ananju, gentile. So in a row, genital, gentle, and gentile. That can, you can make a tongue twister with that. Uh, now let's see if I can remove this. Yay, that worked. Okay, let's do one more halakha and then we'll finish. Who would like to read? Any volunteer? Yes, Rabbi. 
the following principle applies to all blessing, although a person has already re recited them and fulfilled his own obligation. He may recite them again for others who have not fulfilled the, their obligation so that they can fulfill their obligation. Okay. Now it's going to give us more uh, details. Um, Sipora, would you like to read the next paragraph? There is, however, one exemption, blessings over benefit, which is not associated with a mitzvah. In this uh, instance, one may not recite a blessing for others unless one enjoys benefit together with them. Uh, nevertheless, one may recite blessings for Benefit which is associated with a mitzvah, example, eating uh, matzah on Pasa and uh, reciting Kiddush on Sabbaths and festivals for others. They may then eat or drink, even though the one who recites the blessing does not eat or drink with them. Okay. So for all the different barachot, all the different blessings that our sages instituted, you can say that blessing again in order to help someone else fulfill their obligation, even if you already fulfilled your own obligation, right? So this is true even for like the Amidah, for example, the Shemona Esre. That's why we have a repetition of the Shemona Esre. But this is true for all the blessings, except for blessings of benefit. Blessings of benefit are things like a blessing you say before you eat food. Okay? Because you're it's it's not a standard blessing that you say at a certain point in time that's required. You're not required to eat bread every day. You're not required to eat uh cheese or um dal. You don't have to eat that every day. So because of that, it's the exception to the rule. So whoever wants to eat dal, they need to say their own blessing. A person cannot say it for them unless they eat it together with them. But for all the other blessings that don't have to do with food or similar things, all the other blessings, you can say it even though you could say this blessing again for someone else, even though you already said it for yourself. Any questions about that? Questions, no questions, going once, going twice. All right. So we concluded the first chapter of the laws of blessings i think we concluded the 10th halakha here you can see in the hebrew version of our sidur you can see the blessings in hebrew we also have it in english i'm not sure if we have translated this to tamil or telugu or hindi i'm not sure but you have all these different blessings you can find these around page 85 and on so these are blessings for when you see mountains. If you did not see mountains for 30 days, you say, who does the act of creation. If you did not see the ocean for 30 days, but then you saw it again, you say, who made the great sea, who made the large ocean. Let's go back to review what we did last week. Okay. Can you guys see me enlarging this? Yes. Okay. So this is the little verse that we say before we say the Amida. Let's say it together. Adonai. Adonai. Se fa thai. 
تيفتح تيفتح اوفي يا جيد تهيلا تهيلا تخا 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 Adonai Sefatai Tepe Adonai Sefatai Tepe Te Tepe Te Okay, and usually when we have this letter and the two dots under it, well, any letter, if you have any letter in Hebrew with the two dots under it, most of the time, we should assume that it is silent. So instead of tifetah, just tifetah. Tif, instead of tifetah, we should say tiftah, tiftah, uh, tiftah. tiftah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be a short S sound, sometimes. But most of the time, if you're not sure which one, then make it silent, tiftah. Mm. Okay, Tamshiki. Tamshiki, continue. Ufi Yagid Te Tehi La Teha. Tehi La Teha. Tehi La Teha. Perfect. One more time. Tehi La Teha. Tehi La Teha. Beautiful. Okay. Uh... Sonia, are you still with us? Maurice, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, Robert. Would you I'm like to? Right. Oh, yeah. Baruch Haba, welcome home. <laughs> Thank you. Would, would you like to read this line? Again? Yes, sir. All by yourself. Okay. Adonai, the Fatai, the Fah, Ufi, Yagid, the Hilda, the Hawk. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's get one more victim who will be our final victim. Mohan. Am I still I can read? You can or cannot? Cannot. Okay. Uh, are you willing to help us just with the first word? I don't know. You got it. Okay. You know, you shouldn't be lying to us on here. You read that like took you less than a second. Okay, so let's do the second word. <laughs> Second word. Okay, just tell me the letter. What letter is this? Difficult. Which letter is this? Is this a Dalid or a Sin? Dalid. Okay, so Dalid is this one right here. Oh. Okay. So this one, seen. All right. If you have a pen and a paper, write yes. down seen. Seen almost looks like a weird W. Seen. Okay. okay. When the dot is on the left side, it makes an S sound, like snack. When the dot is on the right side, it makes a SH sound, like like she, she, or sheets, or sheep. Okay, so Mohan, when the dot is on the left side, what sound does it make? Uh, next, next. 
S S sound, like the word yes. snack yes. or snake. Yes. Right? So S. This is S. Next letter. Let's look at this letter. Is this letter a Aleph or a Fe? Fe. Okay, so this is Fe. When there is no dot inside of it, it's an F sound, like the word friend. When there is a dot inside of it, it makes a P sound, like the word police. Police. All right. You guys can write this down if, if you... If it's new information for you. When pe has no dot inside, it's an F sound, like the word friend. When there is a dot inside of it, it makes a P like the word police. All right, next letter. Is this a tav or a noon? Noon. Come again? It's noon. All right, so this looks like this is a noon right here. Adonoi. Adonoi. So this is the N sound, as in never. This is a noon. And then this letter is a tav. Tav. When there's no dot inside of the tav, it makes a TH sound, like the word think. Think or three. One, two, three. So when there's no dot in it, it makes a TH sound, like three. When there is a dot in a tav, it makes a T sound, like the word tree, like the word uh, two, one, two. Okay. Now this letter, this is the smallest Hebrew letter. Is this a yud or a sin? Yud, yud. yud. okay, yud. you got it. Now this word is set. It means my lips. All right, you guys, do you have questions about anything? I know we've not spent as much time on the Sidur as I would like, but I think we learned a lot about the Barachot. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Any questions about anything? All right. Rabbi, I do have one question. All right. Go ahead. Bakhavod. So, uh, personally, I start uh, my uh, afternoon prayer, Mincha, start with uh, Ashray. Okay. And uh, finish uh, with Hamida. That's it. Okay. So, how do you, how do, you uh, do that? How do you dive in? I'm going to pull it up for you right here. Afternoon, page 30. Along with the uh, posture and hand gesture. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're getting at there. I know what you're trying to say. Okay. This is. I know uh, how to do uh, Amida. So thanks for oh. your YouTube channel. Oh, really? Since, uh, look last uh, three years awesome <laughs> okay but I, so, um, I missed the ashray so how do you uh, do so ashray, ashray page 30 in the hebrew sidur that i can send to you guys in our group if you don't already have it so the most important the the, the truly like the strict obligation for minha prayer it's not the Ashray, it's not Psalm 145, it's just the Amidah. That's the strict obligation. But there is a halakha, an, an ancient halakha from the Gemara, that before we say the Amidah, we recite Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Okay? The Rambam brings that... Before you say Psalm 145, you say this verse before Psalm 145. But he only mentions this when praying with a minyan, when praying with 10 or more people, 10 or more men. 
If you're praying by yourself, you can begin just with Psalm 145. And I, I say this in a kneeled position, but if you are unable to kneel or if it is so painful it distracts you, then you can just sit, sit down on your rear end, not on your knees. But it's it's proper to sit when we say this because the uh, the way we say it most of the time, like if we're in a minyan, we say, praiseworthy are those who sit in your house. So we're sitting. And what happens is, if we do all of this in the ancient manner, with the ancient postures, we end up worshiping God in all the major stances, with all the major postures of the body. So first we're sitting, and then when we come to the Amidah, we stand. Then when you say Baruch, right? When you say Baruch Atah, at the beginning and at the end of the first blessing of the Amidah, then you kneel onto your knees and you bow over so that your body is like an arch. You do not have to put your face to the ground. But if the ground is clean, you might as well. That's what the Rambam's son says in his book, Hamaspik Lo'ovdei Hashem, the son of the Rambam, Maimonides. So first we were sitting, then we stand, we say, Adonai, Sefotai Tiftah, Ufi Yagiv Tehillotha O Lord, O my master, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. And then when you say Baruch, right as you say Baruch, you kneel onto the ground, you bow over, and you stay bowed over until you say Adonai. As you begin to say Adonai, you are standing up. So you say Adonai as you stand up. I recommend saying Baruch and Ata slowly, saying it slowly. That gives you time to have intention to focus while you're saying it. And bowing in the prayer also helps us to slow down. It is easier to uh, race through the prayers and not take it seriously, not focus and have intention. It's easier to not have intention when we're running through the prayers. But when we bow, it helps slow us down to refocus. So we kneel and bow here. Then we kneel and bow at the end of the second at the end of the first blessing. Then we stand up and we remain standing all the way until we get to Modim. Modim is the next to last blessing in the Amidah. So it's where it says, we are grateful before you. For you are he, the eternal, our God. So when you say Modim, when you get to the word, we are grateful, you kneel down and bow. And you stay bowed down on your knees until you get to Hashem. As you say, Adonai, Hashem, you're standing up again. Then at the end of this blessing, this is the next to last blessing of the Amidah. At the end of it, again, you have Baruch, you kneel, and then you stand up again at Adonai. So you're standing, and then when you finish the final blessing of the Amidah, you say, Baruch atah, am mevorech et amma Yisrael basholem. When you say shalom, then you say amen. As you say amen, you are kneeling again. You kneel down onto the ground, and you stay bowed over until you say, may the words of my mouth and the contemplation of my heart be favorable before you, O eternal, my rock and my redeemer. When you finish that, then you stand up, but you stay bowed over, and you take three steps back, and you give peace to your left and your right. Sipora, would you like to read this for us? Upon completing the Amida, one bends down, take three steps back while Remaining, bend down, gives um, peace to his left 
and to his right and then lifts his head from the bow okay this is literally a quote word for word quote from the Mishneh Torah of the Rambam, the laws of Tefillah, the laws of prayer, chapter 5, the 11th halacha. Okay, Tamshichi, continue, Tamshichi. Hmm. Halakha uh, does not require that any specific words be said while giving faith. Uh, indeed, our Shaddai. So the R means Rabbi, Rab. Uh, writes that uh, this giving peace is no more than a silent nodding of the head to the left and the right for one who desires to um, verbally give peace we suggest the and send Custom as reported by the Riff means reference. Riff is uh, Rabbeinu Al Fasi. He was mm -hmm. he he made the major halachic work that was written before the Rambam's Mishneh Torah. So he basically took all of the Talmud and removed the stories. The Talmud has laws and it has arguments and it also has stories. So he basically gave us the Talmud, but removed the stories so you can more quickly learn just the laws. But he did not do what the Rambam did with the Mishneh Torah. The Rif did not reorganize the Talmud. So the Rambam in the Mishneh Torah organized the, the laws of the Talmud in a very rational way. So the Rif did not do that. And he also does not just give us the law. The Rif also gives us all the arguments, the disagreements and the debates in the Talmud. But it's it's more useful than the regular Talmud because it doesn't have all the side stories and, and legends and everything, which are also useful. But if you want to just learn a law, it makes it more difficult to find. So that's who the Rif was. He was a major rabbi who lived before the Rambam, before Maimonides. So what he says is a very ancient custom. Whereas Rav Sa'ad Yagon, who was even more ancient, more ancient than the Rif. Rav Sa'ad Yagon was the leader of the Jewish world in his generation. He said that when the Talmud says to give peace, there's no obligation to say certain words. It's sufficient. It's enough that you just nod your head to the left and the right. The Rif mentions a custom where you just say peace, peace, and then as you lift your head, you say, he shall make peace. And now in modern times, it's important that we know that the mainstream practice, the popular practice, they say like a whole paragraph while they're give, giving peace to the left and the right. They say, <laughs> then they turn to their right. Uh, I have the Yemenite one memorized, so I, I don't remember <laughs> the Ashkenazi one. The Temani one, the Yemenite one, is even longer. Eh, I'm not going to take our time to say all that. Anyway, so that's the idea. You do not need to say all of those words if you don't want to. That, that's not an obligation. Uh, Maurice, would you like to read what we do after? After we lift our head? After we... I didn't, I didn't get you, Robert. What? So after we finished the Amidah, we took three steps back. Uh -huh. We gave yeah. peace to our left and to our right while we were bent over. Uh -huh. So after you turn to the left and then to your right, you then lift your head. Okay, now you can uh -huh. read this. After you okay, lift your we, head. Okay, we, uh, we turn left, then right. Then Correct. we uh, right. Then we say, uh, Ya say Shalom. Okay. That's a custom. It's an ancient custom, but it's not required. All right, let's continue. Tamshikh Likro, continue reading. When uh, praying without a minya, one continues with the nefilat 
Hanid. If praying with a minion, one remains standing in place, the during duration of the reputation of the Amidah, attentive to the words of the Azan, answering Amen at the end of each blessing. Okay. okay. Continue, some sheikh. When Hazan completes the reputation of the Amida, the entire congregation sits on the ground, fall on their faces, and supplicate according to their desire. So here, so the Amida is a structured prayer. It has structure, it's a ritual prayer. You can add your own voluntary words inside the Amida, but only in the middle blessings, not in the first or last three blessings. So the first and last three blessings of the Amidah should never be added to. But the middle blessings of the Amidah, you're allowed to add to it. Um, but you should not add a whole lot. You should not add as much, so much, that it will make your community be waiting for you. Okay? How Now, after we finish the Amidah, then we sit on the ground, we fall over with our face to the ground. And now we say prayers and, and make requests of God in our own words, whatever you desire. So our sages established what's called nafilat hanim, falling on our face, tahanun, supplications. They established this practice to make sure that the people of Israel continue to pray to God in our own words from our heart. What has happened is that in the majority of synagogues around the world, they have created tradition, traditional prayers that they say during Tahanun, during this part of the prayer. So what happened is everybody is saying a traditional prayer and they're not praying from their heart anymore. And that's that's a problem. We should make sure that we're praying from our heart. Prayer without the heart is not prayer. Okay, so they pray according to their own desires. Tamshikh, continue please. Tamshikh. They then lift their heads and supplicate a bit more while sitting. On praying without a minion does likewise. Okay, and you can find this. Excellent. Yeah. Chapter 5, 13 through 15 halakha. Chapter 7, the 17th halakha, and chapter 9, the 5th halakha. You guys can find this on the Chabad website. It's it's public information. Um, most Jewish communities, and when I say most, I mean almost all of them, do not do this. Almost all of them, if they are Ashkenazi, they fall on their face, but they do it while sitting in a chair. So they prostrate, but not on the ground. Um, and most Sephardic synagogues, they don't, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't do it at all because of the Zohar, because of some Kabbalistic teachings in the Zohar. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the Jews of Yemen continued to practice this halakha more similar to the way it's taught in, in halakha. They continued to do this less than 100 years ago. But when they moved to Israel, many of them were treated badly at first. They're not treated badly like they were at first, but at first. And they had many customs that were different from all the other Jewish communities because the Jews of Yemen were not as influenced from different places like other Jewish communities were. Because Yemen is very, very isolated. It's very far from other places. So it didn't change as much. And they used to be uh, criticized for being like Arabs or being like Muslims. So the Jews of Yemen in the last about 70 years, most of them stopped doing this. But before 70 years ago, the normal practice among the Jews of Yemen was to properly keep the halakha. This is still the halakha. It's just that people don't do it anymore. And if you feel pressure, 
if you are forced to not do it, you still fulfill your obligation. But if you are in a place where you do not feel pressured, you are not forced to not do it. If you're praying at home or in a in your own community and you feel comfortable to do this, then this is what we should do. And eventually the people of Israel will return to doing this. When we worship God in the temple in Jerusalem, chairs are not allowed in the temple. So people will not, they will not be sitting in chairs doing this in the temple. And probably by that time, the, the proper prayer will be restored to the people of Israel. But currently, the mainstream practice, they break this halakha. They don't do it. Okay, let's continue. Uh, Sipora, would you like to read this halakha? <clears throat> Ms. Heather, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Baruch Hashem. Good to see you here. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like to read this for us? Yeah, I can do that. All right. An esteemed individual should not press his face to the ground while supplicating in public. Rather, he should tilt his head a bit while prostrating. Okay. Now, this is a very summarized explanation of this halakha. It's in chapter 5 of the Laws of Prayer, the 15th halakha. And the reason given is that <clears throat> if it's a highly esteemed person, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, <clears throat> I haven't drunk water since I woke up. <laughs> I need to drink some water. Um, if it's a very highly esteemed person and they're leading prayer, so it's it's someone who's going to be considered especially righteous. And we're afraid if this person uh, makes public supplication and publicly presses his face to the ground while praying to God, if he's not answered, then it will be a desecration of God's name. So it is better, there's a halakha, that it's, it's, it's proper that he does not put his face to the ground unless he is righteous like Yehoshua. It doesn't say he absolutely cannot and should not, but he should only do it if he absolutely knows that he is going to be answered. And that would be a little bit presumptuous. So he'd pretty much need to be a prophet. <laughs> so the halakha is that a highly esteemed righteous individual should not press his face to the ground while supplicating in public. It doesn't say he should not put his face to the ground when praying in public, but it's not private supplication. This is only with regard to tahanun, personal supplication. Rather, while he's prostrating, he should tilt his head a little bit. And this is actually where we get the current custom among most Jewish communities, where they don't fully prostrate. It's an extension of this halakha, but it's also a misunderstanding of this halakha. Okay, let's continue. Um, Yosef, would you like to read this final part? And then we will conclude our, our lesson for today. Yes, Rabbi. The Torah forbids full prostration upon hewn stone outside the temple premises. By rabbinic decree, it is forbidden to press one's face into hewn stone, even if not fully prostrate. Does all Israel have the practice to lay out mats in their stone, floored synagogues? Okay, and we can find this in the Laws of Idolatry, Hilchot Havidol Zara, chapter 6, the 10th and 13th, 10th through the 13th halakha. And if we look there, we will see that the Rambam makes it extremely clear that in his lifetime, this is in the eleventh, uh, the eleventh century. <clears throat> in his lifetime, all Israel still had the practice of prostrating onto the floor during the final part of the public prayer, during what we call nefilat panim, falling upon the face and tahanun supplication. 
So anybody have any other questions before we end? Feel free. I, I'm I'm fine for another 10 or 15 minutes. I'm fine. And then we will conclude. Any other questions? Great, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have one more. Did that answer, answer your question? Want to clarify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Shukran. Uh, awesome. Blessing before the Shema. What about before the Shema? Blessings, blessings. Okay. <clears throat> the blessings before Shema. The main, the main idea is that most of these blessings you only say it if you do the action that is associated with it. So, if you say "Pokeah uh, who opens the eyes of the blind, you should only say this uh, as you're rubbing your eyes to make your vision improve in the morning, which many people do. I also do this. Like we naturally do it. If you didn't do that, then you don't say this blessing. <clears throat> if you sorry, you, say what? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So Go ahead. I, I'm talking about uh, the the traditional blessing, not not uh, this this one. Uh, You're talking about the... Oh, okay, okay. I see. Uh, yes. So I'm I'm uh, slightly ups just uh, want to uh, clarify the hand gesture and the prostration. Okay, so I when it comes, to yeah. okay, no problem. So when it comes to Baruchu et Hashem Hamevarach, Baruchu et Adonai Hamevarach, that's what the leader says. And before we continue, these are the blessings that are associated with the reciting of the Shema every morning. Okay, and we also have these at night for the nighttime recitation of Shema. These blessings are an obligation on all men of Israel and all women of Israel. It's praiseworthy if they do this, but they're not strictly obligated to. So before we recite Shema, we're supposed to say these blessings before and after the Shema. If you are praying with a minyan, 10 or more men of Israel, then there's an invitation to prayer, which basically is give worship to the eternal, the most worthy, or Proclaim the eternal. Uh, there are different ways you can translate it, so I don't. I don't want to complicate it. And then there's a response: uh, The eternal is most worthy, the most blessed, forever and ever. Right. So, at, when we say this invitation, there is a universal Jewish custom of bowing when this is said, and it's generally said from a standing position, but you can also do it from a seated position. Um, I recommend starting the saying of this from a standing position, and then when you bow at the baruch, which is the response, then you bow all the way to the ground, so then you're in a seated position. So you started standing, and then you end up in a seated position, while reciting the blessings of Shema. But it's very important to know that any sort of bowing during these blessings, it is a matter of custom. It is not a halakha. You're not required to do it. Albeit it is a universal, it's a pretty much a universal custom. Ashkenazim and Sephardim all over the world bow at this point when they say Boruchu. They do not bow onto the ground. Just like in the Amidah, they do not bow on the ground. So what the ancient practice was and what people do today is very often a little bit different. <clears throat> and I don't recommend bowing onto the ground in a regular synagogue unless you are prepared for the uh, challenges that you will naturally be met with. <laughs> I also very much recommend that you have a piece of paper or a cloth to separate your face from the floor because they do not remove their shoes in most synagogues anymore. The traditional custom all over the Middle East was to remove the shoes before you come into a synagogue. And all over the Middle East, they continue to do this until this last century. So that is actually a new custom to not remove your shoes when you go into a synagogue. Um, but that means that the floor is going to be more dirty. So... I don't recommend doing it unless you have a cloth or something to separate your face from the ground. 
And also, I don't recommend doing it unless you are prepared for the extra difficulty it's likely to make for your life. But certainly, if you're praying alone or with friends who are understanding, then absolutely do this. Bow onto the ground. Um, but again, all the bows of the of the blessings of Shema, they're voluntary. They're not a halakha that our sages required. Local communities can have their own customs. So you can create your own custom for where you bow in your local community. Uh, as long as you recognize that this is your local custom, as long as you don't view someone as breaking uh, strict halakha from the Gemara, all right, we should always distinguish between universal halakha and our local custom and our personal customs. They're not one and the same. Did you have any other questions about the blessings of Shema? I'm so, just curious about the uh, that, okay. that blessing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, when it comes... Remember, it's good to see on, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. What were you saying? Which is on your YouTube channel. The, yes. The, the, that yes, it is. That's YouTube. right. <laughs> now, the son of the Rambam <laughs> gives other places where he uh, says it is customary to bow. And those are places where mainstream Judaism no longer bows. It's not that they disagree with it necessarily. Rather, it's that the entire awareness of this is completely gone. Mainstream Judaism is completely unaware of it. It's not even a dispute. Like, they don't even talk about it. But there are a few other places where you, you can bow. Uh, but these, again, they'd be voluntary bows. And I prefer to... I will send them to you in the WhatsApp group. Let uh, Please remind me in the WhatsApp group if I don't get around to posting it there. Yeah, Robert. All right. So we'll By conclude. Way, Go ahead. Uh, on this uh, last Yom Kippur, on this, we are um, uh, diving to uh, Delhi Shul. And they had their uh, custom on, uh, on, especially on Yom Kippur. We just uh, take off our shoes and uh, we prostrate on a handkerchief. We're that's, taking the separate handkerchief. That's that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. <laughs> so course... I asked you, Rabbi, why don't you do it all, all the time? So he just we, uh, said we the should... same. We just skip this uh, tradition. But we... We don't uh, do uh, reading on this on young people. So it's, Most it's people holiest. don't even know. Yeah, Most people yeah. don't even know that historically it was every day. So that is the, the, the thing is uh, funny. Uh, some uh, guy came from uh, America, maybe uh, New York or uh, Michigan. I'm not sure about him. He take my number. So he, he's an Ashkenazi Jew, and uh, he prospered first time on Yom Kippur with, uh, with, along with us. So he's surprised. So uh, we're saying, uh, uh, why you are uh, doing this? Uh, That's actually a, a normal, on, on Yom Kippur, it's actually a mainstream Ashkenazi practice to prostrate on Yom Kippur. If an Ashkenazi, yeah, but, go ahead. But I'm surprised. He, 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 he didn't say that. He said, we, we are not doing this. Honestly. If an Ashkenazi Jew, yeah, if an Ashkenazi Jew is not familiar with that practice, then it means he is, he doesn't have a lot of experience with the very traditional Orthodox Ashkenazi world. I don't know if Reform or conservative Ashkenazi Jews bow onto the ground. And I strongly suspect that they do not. But there could be some variation with them as well. I mean, they're not all the same. Uh -huh. But that could be why. He may have simply never been at a very traditional Ashkenazi Orthodox synagogue. With with Ashkenazi yeah. traditional Orthodox Haredi Ashkenazim, that is a universal practice on Yom Kippur and also on Rosh Hashanah. Then Rabbi... Uh... Shared his uh, handkerchief to him. So <laughs> That's great. Then <laughs> he prospered. Excellent, excellent. All right, I let's con can... let's conclude our <laughs> yeah, lesson. Thank you, Robert, by the way. My pleasure. We're going to conclude our lesson. <clears throat> if anybody has any other questions, so we're ending our lesson now. But you can share your questions in our WhatsApp group. I'll do my best to respond as soon as I can. 
Um, Brother Yosef. Rav Yosef. Yes, sir, boy. Could you help us by reading this first line of the prayer we say when we finish the house of study? Okay. Just to hear. Uh, which line? The first line. Okay. Modiani Lifanecha Adonai Elohai She Shamta Sorry She Samta Helki Mi Yoshabai Bait Ha Midrash Beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's let's get so let's get someone to continue it, okay? I'm uh okay. I'm testing everybody's practice. I'm I'm testing everybody to see where we got where we are at. Your your Hebrew is Mashu, mashu, hu mashu, something, something, <laughs> something else, something else. That's a compliment. Okay, Maurice, would you like to read the next line? Up to the blue dot, from here to here. Maurice. Yeah, right. Would you like to read the next line from here to here? Okay. I'm using my mobile, so screen is very fine. So uh -huh. I'll just try. Although some talk and key. Me, your share Or not, or where do you see that? Shit on me, 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 shaking, mash, mash. Shani mash. Wahem Shani mash wahem mashkimim. All right. Shani mashkim wahem mashkimim. Sipora tu. My English very tiny. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. I understand. Sipora tur shalach. Sipora, did I, I? I put you to sleep, didn't I? Okay. Let's see. Sipora, would you like to read the next line? Yes, Ani, Mashkim, Mashkim. Le Dari. La Div. La Div. La Div. La Div. Re. La Div. Re. Le Div. Re. Torah. Mehem. Mashki. Mi. Mashki. Mashki. Mim. Good. Lit Vari This is Ba or Va? B is in boy. Anytime there's a dot in the bet, it's B like the word boy or bad or bad boy. Okay. <laughs> Bet, betelim. Beautiful. All right. Um, let's see. 
Rebecca Miriam. Ani, Ani, Emel, Mehem, Amelim. All right, let's get someone to do the next little bit. Rebecca Miriam, you with us? Ani, Amel. <laughs> You're not waiting. <laughs> Let me, I'm not okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me let, let me get someone else. Um my good friend Chip is here. I want to ask him if he would like to read. Yo, homie, Chip. Habibi. We can't hear you. Hello? Hello. Rabbi, can I yes, can I read? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. Okay, toda. Ani Amel U Mikabel Sahar We Hem Amalim We Ain Mekabelim Shahar. Okay, let's slow slow down. All right. So when we have a mem, not it's not just mem. When we have a word that in, that has a shava, the two little dots, they're called shava. If we have a shava, there are two types of shava. There's a shava that is a short e eh sound, short e, eh, like eh. And then there's a shava that is silent. It just means there's no vowel here, no vowel. So shava can be either of those, sometimes an e, eh, sometimes no vowel. Generally, we should assume it makes no vowel. More times than not, it makes no sound. It just is the end of a syllable, end of a part of a word. So instead of um kabel, it would just be um kabel, um kabel, um kabel. Let's read it again. Go ahead, read it one more time. Rav Yosef. Efuata. Hello, hello. Yes. Ani Amel Um Kabel Sahar Vehem Amelim Ve Ain Ani Rutz Lehai Ha Olam Haba Vehem Razim Liba Er Sahat. All right. Now, when we read Aleph, we need to be careful not to make it like Ain. So instead of live air, you want to say live air, live air. Live air. So not live air, but live air, live air. This is a regular E-H sound, like in English, air, air. Like we breathe air, live air. The reason that's important is if we pronounce the Aleph here, like the letter Ayn, this is Ayn for everybody to see, that's Ayn. If we pronounce this aleph like ayin, it changes the meaning of the word completely, completely changes it. Liv er means to the pit or to the hole. It's a hole. If we read it with an ayin, liv er, it means to burn, to burn. <laughs> so the difference between aleph, the difference between aleph and ayin, it's important in Hebrew. All right. On that note, I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. May it be God's will that he give us a heart to run, to keep his mitzvot, to be kind to each other, to be forgiving and patient, and a heart to know him, to know his name, and to know and value all creation. Shalom al Yisrael. Can you hear son? May it be God's will. When Omar and everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, now everybody repeat after me. Everybody repeat after me. Am. Am. Yisrael. Yisrael. Hi. 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 
One more time. Am Israel Hai. Am Israel Hai. All right. That means the people of Israel live. As long as God lives, we shall live. Am Israel Hai. Shabbat Shalom. 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 Shabbat Shalom.